All right. So, <coughs> good afternoon. What we are going to do now uh, today is dive a little bit deeper into the AXI bus, right? Uh, the ARM bus, which is specifically uh, which was defined as by the company ARM, primarily for use with their processors, but has since then been extended in certain ways and is also now become a very popular bus that is used for many different kinds of microcontrollers and microprocessors, right? Part of the reason for that is ARM very sensibly, I think, made the protocol itself an open protocol and they didn't sort of say, okay, we are the only ones who are going to make use of it, which means that others can also implement it and make peripherals and devices that are compatible with the core bus. And like we discussed last time, the whole idea of a bus in this way is that once you have a master that is compliant with the bus, it can talk to any slave that is in turn compliant with the bus and vice versa. If you are designing a slave peripheral, all you need to do is make sure that it follows the protocol of the bus in terms of how to respond to write requests, read requests and so on. And as long as that happens, it will then be able to connect to any master that is compliant with that bus. So what does this bus compliance mean? What are the steps involved? What are the kinds of transactions? That's what we are going to look at in a little bit more detail today. So just a word of uh, the background for the figures that I've used in this uh, presentation. Uh, pretty much all of them are from one of these two documents, either the AMBA specification. AMBA basically stands for the ARM, the Advanced Microcontroller Bus Architecture. right? And uh, AMBA is what ARM first proposed for their uh, system buses. right? The version 2.0 was in use for a very long time. It gave rise to a couple of different variants called the AMBA High Performance Bus or AHB and the AMBA Peripheral Bus APB. Right? And using some of the learnings from those implementations, from those buses, ARM then extended it and came out with uh, version 3 which they call the AXI, the Advanced Extensible Interface. Okay, And AXI 3 then led to AXI 4, currently there is an AXI 5. The main point is each of those has been brought in for a specific purpose. They increase the functionality of the systems in some way or the other or try and streamline certain kinds of operations. Okay, These two documents are uh, freely available from the ARM website. You can download them and look at them. I'll also put them onto the Moodle so that you can take a look. But uh, most of the figures that I've used over here are essentially directly from one of these two documents. So let's start with a generic picture of what a high performance bus based system looks like. right? So what we are essentially talking about is something like this. What we have is, I mean, of course, this is defined by ARM. Therefore, they assume that what you have is an ARM processor, a high performance ARM processor, as they call it, right? The, uh, all right, I uh, don't think I need to use the journal application, if necessary, we'll just switch to that later. So uh, the high performance ARM processor that we have over here is any ARM processor, right? Uh, by ARM processor, what we mean is things that follow the instruction set defined by ARM. The other peripherals that you can see this, what we have over here is something called the AHB, right? Which is the AMBA high performance bus. And on the right hand side, you can see that there is something called the APB or the AMBA peripheral bus, right? So the expansions of those are basically given below over here, right? So the AMBA high performance bus, like we discussed last time, is used to connect those peripherals that have high performance requirements. The most obvious one is the high bandwidth on chip RAM, the memory. There is another memory interface which is off chip, right? So what is the difference between the on chip and on chip off chip memory? The on-chip uh, memory is usually the cache or some other relatively small amount of RAM that is used just for storing data temporarily, right? Typically, the what is required of on-chip memory is that it is very fast, meaning that once I give out a request, the response comes back very quickly. 
the flip side of that is typically it cannot have the same high density that DRAM does right so the high bandwidth memory interface goes off chip to DRAM which is typically megabytes or hundreds of megabytes whereas the on chip RAM is typically in the kilobytes range and of course we have something called the DMA bus master DMA is direct memory access like I said earlier what it allows you the system to do is rather than the ARM processor when it wants to transfer data from one place to another rather than having to worry about reading in individual words and copying them into the destination it can just tell the DMA master go do some work right transfer data from A to B and the DMA master will then take care of doing that during that time assuming that the processor does not need anything else that accesses the bus the DMA can keep working and the processor in its turn can work on something else okay now we'll see later how this can actually be useful how you can have multiple masters sort of interleaving and sort of trading data or trading usage of the bus so that uh, the effective utilization of the bus is very high and each of the masters can be kept busy to a large extent on the right hand side the APB the UART that's the serial port timer keypad general purpose input output pins all of those are much lower frequencies than what we have on the left hand side the AHP okay so this is a very generic diagram all that it says is this is what a typical high performance bus based system would look like okay so now let's start looking at what a bus transaction looks like okay and as far as the bus transaction is concerned we need to essentially look at a lot of these timing diagrams okay so these timing diagrams are going to be common throughout the rest of this presentation you can sort of figure out what is going on over here essentially what is being said is that you have a clock signal with right on top and the clock signal essentially is just a square wave right as you can see over here and as the square wave sort of goes through its cycles we have these vertical lines that are drawn over here that essentially indicate cycle boundaries okay and what we are going to be interested in is there are a whole lot of other signals control as well as data and what are the states of those signals at the control boundaries okay so this is a typical very simple kind of data transaction right the simplest form of data transaction bus transaction that can take place on a AMBA bus right the original version of the ARM AXI bus what are the components that are involved over here the signals that we are interested in apart from the clock of course one is the address then comes some control which we are sort of leaving blank at the moment we are not going to mention what that is then there are these other signals the HW data the H ready and the HR data okay so one thing you would notice over here is like I said earlier the control of course we are not yet specified exactly what is going on over there but presumably that takes care of including things like you know are you trying to read or write etc right I am indicating a transaction where there is both HW data as well as HR data okay now the interesting thing over here is you would need to keep in mind that effectively what we are doing is we are splitting the writing part of the bus and the reading part of the bus into two separate components right and in principle at least according to this diagram I can both write and read at the same time because I have two sets of wires one doing writing the other doing reading usually that's not very useful because I only have one address so all that it means is I can write something into the same address that I'm reading from okay that's not a very common occurrence but this is used only for illustration and to sort of tell you that yes in principle it's possible to have writing and reading happening at the same time from an implementation point of view we just do it this way because it's easier to visualize things by saying that there are separate write and read buses even though the diagrams the high level diagrams that we draw sort of indicate that you know they are the same bus right in practice they go through some tri-state logic and end up coming out as two separate buses inside the chip so what does this simple bus transaction look like what you can see is there is an address phase during which the address signal the address bus as well as the control signals are set to some values okay 
notice how the timing diagram is drawn essentially what it has over here is there is this portion where essentially we are saying that you know wherever it is gray it is an unknown or undefined state right it is going through some transitions so all that it's saying is after this first positive edge of the clock the address as well as the control signals go through some transitions and will change their values to whatever we want for our transaction okay and once it becomes this solid white section over here it means that the address and the control signals have stabilized what happens nothing until the next edge of the clock okay at the next edge of the clock the address is sampled okay so that's typically the terminology that's used what we say is that the address is sampled by the receiver either the bus interface or by the slave itself directly right the once the address is sampled at that edge it is free to change immediately after that okay so the assumption is that whatever slave is listening whether it be the bus interface itself or the actual slave inter uh, slave interface it has to sample the address and the control signals at the positive edge of the clock and immediately after that those signals are allowed to change immediately meaning whatever one hold time after that effectively okay what about so the transaction itself takes place in two phases there is this address phase and then there is the data phase so what we said is i gave the address a and the control corresponding to that transaction over here during the address phase and during the next the data phase i will make hw data this is done by the bus master right whoever put out the address is also the one putting out the data over here onto hw data and i will also put out a ready signal to indicate that uh, or rather no the ready signal is actually coming back from the other side so the hw data is coming from the bus master the ready signal is sent by the slave okay and whether or not it was ready before at this point after it sees a new transaction it then has to decide whether or not it is ready in this case it decides yes it is ready and makes the ready signal high okay some time after that it also makes the data on the read data bus it sets it to whatever value it has found corresponding to this address transaction a okay and at the next clock edge after that if i look at the hw data the slave can capture this data at that clock edge if i am talking about hr data the master can capture this data at this clock edge in other words if the master is trying to read then it would look at hr data if the master is trying to write the slave needs to capture the value of hw data either way only if the slave has asserted h ready that is made it equal to 1 does this transaction complete successfully okay what exactly does that mean we'll get to that in a moment what happens if the slave is not ready at a given point in time okay but before that let's just quickly look at what the structure of the bus would look like internally right essentially what we are saying is i could have multiple masters master number 1 2 3 and slave 1 2 3 4 okay it doesn't matter i can increase or decrease any of these numbers as i want the point is this middle portion right which essentially corresponds to what i have broadly marked as arbiter with some signals coming out of it and as you can see effectively what that arbiter is doing is it's sending a select signal which decides which of these masters m1 m2 or m3 is going to be responsible for the h address signal that is coming out here okay and similarly which of them is going to generate the hw data that comes out over here okay so you remember we discussed earlier that there are either a multiplexer or a tri state approach can be used in order to implement a shared bus the amba bus is designed around the idea that you use multiplexers okay now in practice multiplexers themselves can be implemented using tri state so this doesn't actually specify how exactly you are going to implement it this is only the logical view of things okay but logically the way to think about the bus is to say that there are multiple masters and the arbiter's job is to use a multiplexer in order to determine which of those masters gets to drive data onto h address as well as hw data 
and on the return side there is the decoder right which basically says which of these slaves is going to drive hr data okay so obviously there has to be some signal that goes to each of the slaves to tell it okay you have been selected now work okay how does this multiplexing actually work the masters go through the address and control mux this decoder takes part of the address right part of the address is sent to the decoder and that then det uh, determines the h select s1 h select s2 h select s3 signals okay so we already saw that is how memory mapped interfaces work they take out part of that 32 bit address maybe the top 16 bits decide that if it matches something like you know 4120 etc this corresponds to the gpio bus gpio peripheral if it's some other number then it corresponds to the fft uh, peripheral right and therefore generates a select signal corresponding to that on the and this essentially is the other thing that happens the decoder also has to do one more thing which is that there are these there, there is another decoder rather not one which works off the h address there is another decoder which comes from the arbiter which essentially takes care of giving the grant signals okay to each of the masters now what exactly is the grant signal and how is it used intuitively the idea is very simple it is sort of like a chip select for the master right effectively saying only when the grant signal is high that master is allowed to drive data onto its output bus now who decides that chip select who decides the grant that is the arbiter okay so with all of this in mind let's just look at the pretty much the same data the bus transaction that we saw earlier right the h address and control are set to some value a during the address phase but now the difference is immediately after the address phase the slave looks at the address looks at the control signals interprets what is being asked for and says i am not ready it basically makes the ready signal zero what does the master have to do it doesn't have to retain the address and control signals it can change them right but on the other hand whatever it changes to it now has to basically wait in other words if it was trying to write data it has to make sure that that data signal remains high until the slave says okay ready and i accepted that data so nothing else can happen during this time okay the master cannot just give up and say okay you know i'll do something else i can't take away permission and give it to somebody else right or at least if i want to do something of that sort then i need to be a bit more intelligent about how i do it in this basic kind of structure if the slave says no not ready that's it the entire bus freezes it has to wait until the slave becomes ready okay but eventually we assume that the slave does become ready after a while and the moment it becomes ready then the very next clock edge after that the data coming from hw data is sampled into the slave if you were trying to do a read or the slave would have made sure that the data that is available over here is correct and the master can then accept it keep in mind that at the previous two clock edges even though there might have been some data at those clock edges they are not considered valid data the master should not do anything with them okay so it's very simple just use this h ready signal and you can essentially insert wait states into the bus transaction as you want of course what you need to be careful of is if it is just implemented in this way potentially one badly written slave badly designed slave can effectively destroy a system by just pulling h ready low and leaving it there the moment the master tries to talk to it it will never get a response and it will hang over there okay that can happen in the past at least there were situations where this was not even a very rare occurrence it was quite easy to create something which could just hang the entire system nowadays people usually introduce a lot of other variations on the bus to prevent such things from happening how do we extend this we can go to multiple transfers right now the most simple kind of multiple transfers would have been finish one transaction completely a and control is done i get back the data and then start the next one obviously wasteful of time we can do something called pipelining 
where what we do is we just say that I will give out the address and control corresponding to A. I know that it will take at least one clock cycle to finish that particular transaction but during the next cycle I will go ahead and say what I want to do next. I will give the address and control corresponding to B. Okay. One cycle later the data from A comes back. In the third cycle I have started giving the data correspond the address and control for C but my slave was not ready. Okay. So what happens C just gets extended out by one cycle the right data corresponding to B also has to be extended out right so all of those things they just it's pretty much intuitive whatever you would expect to see is happening over here it's just that that ready signal becoming low automatically stretch things out by appropriate number of clock cycles okay now this is great provided that there is only one bus master right there is only one device connected to the bus that is capable of changing the values of H address and control what happens if that's not the case that's something we have to think about okay and that's where the question of the bus request and bus grant signals come in okay so the bus request assuming that you have multiple masters connected in a system the bus request is something that a master can just pull high at any time okay so in this case during cycle t1 some bus master asserts the request signal okay now these squiggly lines over here are used to indicate that t2 may not be the next clock cycle after t1 or rather t3 may not be the next clock cycle after t2 okay there could be any number of states in between over here before the grant signal actually comes okay why might that happen usually because somebody else is using the bus so even though i have requested the bus i don't get it i don't get the grant but the way that the master is supposed to work is only after getting the grant signal on the next clock edge after that the H master signal which is again something determined by the bus will change to the value number one to indicate that bus master number one has now got permission it will change to whatever number identifies that master that request that was granted permission okay on that same clock cycle right the master can now go and start putting its H address and control signals and in the next cycle give the HW data and so on. Okay. So in other words, no matter when it requested the bus, only after it has been granted the bus can it start its address and data phases. And you can see that you know there is further between the request and the grant there is at least one clock cycle delay between the grant and the master putting out the address there is another cycle delay so if i have a situation where i am going to be continuously switching between these kinds uh, between different masters there is definitely going to be some loss in efficiency okay so at least one thing that can be done over here even though it may not solve the problem of what happens when i switch from one master to another is to say a very common mode in which I want to get data from a slave is in so called burst mode meaning that I want to if I want to read one particular value I then want to read the next several values okay this is an example of something called a burst read right there is a new signal over here called H trans by the way you don't need to worry too much about the details of these signals I am just going through them over here to indicate how things are implemented in practice right but this is also specific to the AXI bus so it's not that it's a very general uh, you know I mean in other words if you look at some other bus like the Avalon bus from Altera or uh, the Wishbone bus used by OpenRisk they will have a different set of signals but at least conceptually you will find very similar kinds of signals in all of those okay so the burst transaction essentially has one extra signal over here called H trans which is basically saying the transfer type okay what you can see over here is the H address again is you know put out by the master there is something which indicates the burst type okay we will get to that in a moment and there is also the H write and some other control signals out here 
H data, H W data, H ready and H R data are pretty much the same as what we were discussing earlier, right? The thing to keep in mind over here is now let's take a slightly closer look at the addresses that we have, right? The H address that is present over here starts off with the value 0x38, okay? Some address, we don't care what it is, right? And in fact, the actual address, it's a 32-bit address, so it has a lot of other values which I'm masking off. I'm showing you only the last eight bits over here. Fine, so I put that over there. Corresponding to that, the H trans value is set to some binary value which which is understood to mean non-seek. Non-seek means non-sequential. Okay. The easiest way to understand that is by looking at the next value which says sequential. Right. Which basically means that this is the very first transaction in the burst and the next three transactions are sequential increments of the starting address. Okay. How do I know the next three? Because this burst, the H burst value is set to a four burst wrapping sequence. Okay. What does a four burst wrapping sequence mean? Look at the addresses. It's first 0x38. The next address is 0x3c, which if you do the math in hexadecimal is this 38 plus 4. Now 3c plus 4 should have gone to 40, right? But what we say is instead it wraps around, okay? And it wraps around on a boundary of 16. In other words, only this bottom value over here, the c gets set to 0, okay? So the next value becomes 0x30. Next one after that is that plus 4, so 0x34. Okay. There are other ways instead of wrap 4, I could just do increment 4, which means it would just increment 4 times. Okay. So all of these, why are the, these different kinds of bursts introduced? Because people have found that they are often useful in different kinds of code. Okay. It turns out that if you have a wrapping burst, then there are certain kinds of codes that can be automatically optimized for that. If you have a for loop, which is purposely reading through one array, let's say you're doing an, a filter, right? At the end of going through all the coefficients, you have to wrap back to zero and start again, right? A burst read of that sort is probably useful in such a context. So burst reads, even though they cannot get over the entire handshaking overhead, will still allow you to sort of say, okay, you know, I can go through this entire process of, I, I can automatically push some of the complexity if necessary into the slave logic and thereby ensure that certain kinds of transactions are done in a slightly more compact and efficient way. This is a busy slide, but effectively all that you need to focus on is H grant M1 and H grant M2 right? What does that mean? One is going from 1 to 0 and the other is going from 0 to 1. The arbiter has switched ownership of the bus from M1 to M2 at some point in time. Okay. But look at what's happening over here. If I look at the duration corresponding to master 1, at the time T3, when the transition was made from M1 to M2, it was still in the middle of a burst. Okay. So what happens? Do I have to immediately drop everything and switch over? No, it allow the bus basically allows that master M1 to continue until it finishes that burst and then ownership in cycle number T5 switches over to master number two, which can then go ahead and start putting out its address and control signals and so on. Okay. In between, you can see that the H ready is going through a number of up down phases. That is what is basically stretching out these transactions to two cycles each and so on, right? But the point is the bus protocol by itself is defined at a sufficiently abstract level that you really don't care how many cycles are there between each of these operations. That's the power of the protocol, right? All that it says is it specifies the meaning of each of these different kinds of signals and by appropriately using the signals, you can get pretty much any kind of handshaking functionality that you want. Okay. So this essentially is used to illustrate that, you know, how would I transfer ownership of the bus? The arbiter would change the grant signal from M1 to M2. M1 still has time to finish its burst, but as soon as it has finished that particular burst, 
it can't start another burst it can't start any further transaction because ownership has been switched over to m2 at that point now all of this was using something called the amba bus right which was version 2.0 of the arm um, uh, microcontroller bus in version 3 they introduced a slightly modified variant of this right essentially they found that there were based on their analysis of how people were using the protocol in version 2 they came up with some enhancements one of them was they essentially proposed this concept of channels for reading and writing okay so what from here onwards what we are looking at is something called the axi bus it refers more to the axi bus which is after all a variant of the amba bus okay in the axi bus the read address channel essentially says that it is a master interface just gives out address and control it's just given once i don't have to give addresses for every single read value the slave will then respond which with a series of read data okay one way to look at to understand this is effectively every transaction now is considered a burst you can change the length of the burst to anything you want right within certain limits but every transaction will just have one address and control signal going out corresponding to it you can think of that as the address channel which is used to communicate that information to the slave and the slave then responds on the read data channel with possibly multiple data coming back what happens in the case of writing once again only one address and control followed by multiple write data going out on the write data channel okay now there is something called the write response channel right there has to be handshaking the slave has to somehow get back saying yes i accepted this it could be something as simple as the h ready signal or there could be something a little bit more complicated to tell the master what is being responded to right and thinking of this right response channel as something that can convey more information than just the ready signal actually allows us to bring in one additional level of control right which we will see later that additional level of control is essentially something called the axi id the transaction id identifier okay so effectively what happens is let's say that we are talking about a write transaction right along with all the other signals the address size valid ready and so on there is also a signal called awid okay and that awid is essentially saying this is the id used for the write transaction as you can see over here that's essentially going 0 1 2 it's just incrementing okay so why should i bring in something of that sort what's the purpose of bringing in an id associated with every write transaction it looks as though all that i've done is add a few more signals to my bus okay this becomes crucially useful when we look at what can happen if i had a system that had one very slow slave okay so what would happen in the amba ahb bus is that i would need to give out addresses like this right let's say that i wanted to do a four burst read followed by another two burst read and a two burst read right so the addresses corresponding to that would be a11 a12 a13 a14 that's the first burst a21 a22 would be the second a31 a32 would be the third and so on right now let's say that a11 is basically going out to a peripheral that is very slow to respond has a high latency okay what will end up happening is a11 a12 a13 a14 are put out on the bus the slave immediately makes ready low you just have to wait until the data from that slave comes back and d11 is coming back out here d12 is here d13 is here it's basically going off the edge of the page right so i can't even like show you when it uh, d21 is going to come back okay but the only thing that is clear is d21 can only come back after all of these have finished but what if d21 corresponded to a fast peripheral let's say the on chip ram right then this is an unnecessary waste of resources 
axi the first thing is everything is now a burst transfer therefore i do not need to do this a11 a12 a13 a14 i don't need to give out four addresses just that one clock cycle giving the a11 and the burst length was sufficient right the second thing is because i now have transaction ids i can think of doing things out of order okay so a11 goes the bus is not able to respond to that immediately or rather the slave is not able to respond that doesn't matter i can still go to a21 now this could be from the same master it need not be that i'm actually switching masters over here because if i wanted to switch masters i would still need to go through the bus request grant all of that but in principle even that can be possible you know i'll probably add a couple of cycles over here that's all but even if it's with the same master the same master might issue the next bus request a21 now the interesting thing is let's say that a21 is coming back fast i straight away get the data d21 and d22 that burst happens successfully okay i can then go further i could have given a31 over here or maybe i just you know wait and give a31 after another cycle it doesn't matter when right let's say that a31 also comes back it has some more latency than 2 but on the other hand still comes back a couple of cycles later right but all the data is now available and a11 only now has finally got the data ready and d11 is able to come back right what would happen if 3 operation 3 was pushed still one cycle further d31 and d32 over here that's okay uh, once i have granted the permission to this particular transaction to go ahead that transaction completes and only then the d11 d12 etc can start okay so obviously i am glossing over a lot of details over here but in principle at least you can see how this can be made to happen the moment i associate the transaction id with every transaction it means that the arbiter the master as long as they all understand mutually what is going on it's possible to essentially switch over from one transaction to another and say i will wait until that uh, you know uh, let other transactions go ahead and wait until this transaction has time to complete okay so with that i'm going to stop the discussion of the bus protocols hopefully this is enough to give you an idea of what kind of complexity goes into a bus right it's not just a set of three wires right there's a lot more to it all that complexity essentially goes into the design of the arbiter as well as some of the other handshaking logic built around it okay there are many different buses used in many kinds of computer systems the axi bus is the one that's typically used for arm based system nowadays but is also taking off in a big way for most other microcontrollers and microprocessors for a lot of others i think including the risc 5 system that is becoming very popular now okay but if you look at the intel x86 for example that has a different bus structure the uh, mips the sun spark many of those kinds of things usually have they, many of them have different types of bus structures of their own but the complexity wise they are all going to be similar and the capability wise okay so we'll stop here for now in the next class we'll start looking at what happens when you want to move beyond the idea of uh bus right and what we will do without going into too much detail and implementation aspects will be to look at the concept of a network on chip and how it can solve some of the problems associated with buses okay all right so we'll stop here for now there will be a uh, quiz we'll get back to the quiz schedule now um, and uh, yeah a couple of other quick announcements i hope all of you got the email about submitting your uh, project abstracts please make sure that's done by tonight Uh, i want to basically review those and try and get back with feedback about whether it is sufficient work for the group size etc as quickly as possible so that you can get working uh, tomorrow i think is there's no class uh, so we will have class on friday okay because i want to sort of get some of the uh, further material covered as quickly as possible okay 